And I don't believe that people are, are put together randomly. I don't think you and I were put together randomly. I don't think that the listener listening to this podcast... They don't meet randomly. No, right. nothing no. happens randomly. The, the listener that you are listening to my voice and Jared's voice today on this podcast, there's a reason you tuned in to this. Yeah. And, yeah. and I don't, I gave up trying to figure it out years ago. And the more I, <laughs> the more I just let it happen, the more the doors fly open and I meet these amazing people. Welcome to Hey Chaplain. My name is Jared Altick and I'm a chaplain with the police department. I make this podcast so that cops can hear encouragement from other cops. I know that not every cop is going to sit down and have a cup of coffee with their chaplain, but it's my mission to bring encouragement and wisdom to police officers all around the world. So on this podcast, you'll hear from detectives and dispatchers, U.S. Marshals and County Sheriffs, and even the occasional firefighter, but I'll warn you first before that happens. From the LAPD to Scotland Yard, the guests on Hey Chaplin are giving you the wisdom gleaned from their experience so that you don't have to do everything the hard way. This episode, we're continuing our conversation with Tim Akerbrot. Previously, Tim had told us a great story about a young man he didn't shoot who became a friend to the cop who helped send him to prison. It was a story about second, third, and fourth chances and how it's healthier for the cop not to dismiss repeat offenders as lost causes. This judgment is difficult to avoid and sometimes it is necessary, but it's also unhealthy to be cynical and negative all of the time. And finding the balance might take you your entire career. Now Tim is going to share another story about how easy it would be to pass judgment on an individual who appears to be nothing more than a pile of trash. Literally. Here's Tim Uh, It For me, law enforcement was a calling. I mean, there was no, it wasn't a job. I know a lot of people that, that when they're working, it, it is a job and it, that's sure. fine. Uh, but I knew in kindergarten I was going to be a cop without question. And uh, so for me, it was a calling. And and that means I'm a part of a bigger program, a bigger, there's bigger it's mission. more than just me. Yep. Yep. And uh, so if I can go out there and enforce the jobs and lock people up and do that, enforce the laws, that's fine. But if I'm locking the same person up, well, maybe I can do one thing different. Because this isn't working. Locking the person up every single time, it's it's obviously not working because mm-hmm. they're still screwing up by the numbers. And if I can take a little bit of time and say, what's going on? You know, what? Uh, why Why are you so angry at the world? You know, and, uh, you, know you talked about those seasons, and I, I lived all of those seasons, the, the, uh, every single one of them. And it was, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm, honored and blessed to be in the season I'm in right now, you know, where I can look back and I don't have many regrets in my career. Uh, I made a lot of mistakes and, but it got me to where I'm at right now. And I, I was able to kind of calm my mind down and, and, uh, and not just assume this is another dirt bag that I'm dealing with, you know, and that those, those titles we can give people. And, but it's, it's not easy, especially these, you know, like in the busy cities and we, we, in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota, we'd have on a busy night, maybe like five or six calls, you know, so not, not a lot of, uh, a lot of, there was a lot of proactive traffic stops and stuff like that, but um, not a lot of calls for service. And so I get it when sometimes that us versus them can get into that Metro versus small or, or deputy versus state patrol or, you know, it, it right. never ends with us versus them. But uh, for me, the critical piece was recognizing that, you know, I'm doing a job in Roadhouse when Patrick Swayze said it, don't take it personal. and Be nice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was that hardcore, the speed limit is 55, not 56, you know, and it was mm. black and white. And uh, But then when I started to relax that a little bit and recognizing that these are people in my community and, yeah. you know, that I can still 
you know, do my job, but I don't have to be such a uh, jerk about it. And I was, I was that jerk for a long time. And then, then I wasn't the jerk for a while. And, and get where we could have some compassion on the people that we're dealing yeah, with. Where we're recognizing that we're still dealing with human beings that have the same needs that we have. They want to be recognized. They want to be seen. They want to be cared for. They're looking for love. They're looking for, you know, yep. acceptance. And that's, Everybody, we're all doing that. So it's hard to turn off the cop in you, even even after you retire, even when you're off duty, even when you're on vacation. You just can't help but but have kind of a cynical view toward people and to always be doing the threat assessment and uh, looking for the exits and watching the door and all that kind of thing. It's hard. It's hard to not do that. And we're good at it. I mean, we're we're yeah. we're good at reading people usually, but then on the flip side, we're horrible at it. When you're looking at it from the lens of the police officer, that as a everything's a potential threat, and you know, or you're just you're assuming you know all about this person, and you don't, and it's it's so hard to shut off. And even after I retired from law enforcement, we were on vacation in uh, Cabo San Lucas, Mexico, and it's gorgeous. And beautiful weather, and we were there with family and friends, and we had a ritual of going out early and watching the sunrise. And uh, staying at a hotel or a house, yep, or yep, at Cabo Vs. Yeah, it's a resort, and we set my alarm and and uh, got out there on this viewing deck before the sun started coming up, and and as the sun started coming up, we could see people walking on the beach and I could see this black clump kind of on the beach. And I didn't know if it was like a garbage bag or what it was. And it was, you know, we weren't on the beach. We were just on this viewing deck of our our resort and kind of above the beach. Yeah. And I was like looking down and I thought, what is that? And uh, so I made a comment to my son that was with me and I just started walking down there and as I got closer, I could see that it was a, a man. It was a person laying there in the, he probably, I don't know if he slept there all night or or what, but, you know, no shoes and he had a, a jacket he was using as a blanket and there was a guitar laying next to him. And I love playing guitar. So I just, I approached this guy and I spoke enough Spanish and he spoke enough English and I said, hola, es tu guitarra? You know, like, is that your guitar? And yeah. and he said, yeah. And uh, so we started talking. But right away, you know, in my mind, I was thinking, "There's this is a bum. I mean, he's a hobo, you right. know, and just, uh, just uh, a homeless guy sleeping on the beach. And I had already put him into this category of sure. uh, just kind of what a sad existence or whatever, you know, Probably well, in- and and have you ever met a homeless person that didn't have a knife? Right. I yeah. Mean, All of that. You know, yeah. There's just there's things like that going through your head too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and what's he doing here? And and yeah, should he be moved along? Maybe. And and I wasn't trying sure. to be like Johnny security guard or anything like that. I was just. <laughs> yeah. I was just like. I mean, that's what you do. I mean, you just you walk toward the the odd things and. Uh, yeah. And just wanted to check it out, make sure it was safe for these people walking and all that other. And then when I saw he had a guitar, I just asked him about his guitar. And and there was a sticker on it said, that said Kenneth. And uh, the name Kenneth. And my, my dad's name was Kenneth. And my father-in-law's name was Kenneth. And they're both deceased. So that struck me, you know, that he had this guitar named Kenneth. And that was my dad's name. And... Uh, so here we are, two complete strangers sitting on the beach in Mexico watching the sunrise. And uh, he gave me his guitar and he said, you know, whatever. He mumbled something in Spanish. And so I started making up songs. And, and I was thinking this guitar, and that was another prejudgment. I was thinking this is going to be a piece of crap guitar with four strings out of six. And it's going to be out of tune. But it was like... <laughs> It had a fresh set of strings and it was tuned properly. And I was like, wow, this is odd. And so I started making up songs in Spanish and just like gibberish. Every Spanish word that I knew how to say, I was <laughs> forming it into a song. And and he was laughing. And then we even had like a chorus where he would join me on the chorus, you know. And it was, I don't know, it was like bizarre and all completely made up. And then... Uh, 
Then I gave him back his guitar, and I figured this was the end of it. And so then he took his guitar, and then he started playing. I was like, holy crap, this guy is good, like really good. And then he started singing. I was like, holy crap, this guy is phenomenal. And so I have was. often had trouble telling the difference between beach bums and musicians. So, oh, wow. Well, hey, yeah, thanks. Yeah. I appreciate it. <laughs> I, re- I resemble that remark. <laughs> yeah, but he's but super he, talented. He starts super singing, talented. he's playing. Yeah. Dirty fingernails. Uh, his, he had like sand and crap in his hair, like seaweed stuff. And he, <laughs> he looked like death warmed over. And there he was. And he started singing. I'm like, Man, this guy's got some chops, you know, and yeah. uh, there was no case for the guitar, no nothing. And uh, so I gave him a challenge coin like I do for just random strangers. And I I just told him about uh, my mom and this I am, I can, I will challenge coin. And and I don't even know if he understood half of what I was saying because it was there was a huge language barrier. But uh, uh, and then we shook hands and parted ways. But and as we were walking away, I thought, you know what? If I had assumed everything I knew about this guy, that that he was just some worthless piece of society that, that you know, get going, you scum. And if I would have yeah. assumed, assumed that, or if I would have gone down there, like with my cop mannerisms and just, you know, yeah. like, hey, buddy, your you need cop, to move. Your cop disposition. Yeah. Hey, yeah. buddy, you need to move along. This isn't the place to take a nap. Go on. Uh, if I would have done that, I would have completely missed out on a really cool opportunity to meet this amazing human being. And it, and I don't believe that people are, are put together randomly. I don't think you and I were put together randomly. I don't think that the listener listening to this podcast. They don't meet randomly. No, right. nothing no. happens randomly. The, the listener that you are listening to my voice and Jared's voice today on this podcast, there's a reason you tuned in to this. Yeah. And yep. and I don't I gave up trying to figure it out years ago. And the more I <laughs> the more I just let it happen, the more the doors fly open and I meet these amazing people and I recognize yep. I'll never meet him again. I you know, he told me his name was Joe Kamish. And uh, I have no idea if that's even his that's real a, name. That's a stage name. That's a stage yeah, totally, name. Totally, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh yeah, I guess I should scour YouTube to see if uh <laughs> He's got some entourage and stuff. They go back and, to the hotel. He may be performing there later. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they have a life. They have a, a they have yep. goals, they have dreams, they have aspirations, and they are a human being that makes mistakes and they deserve the the community deserves that we're dealing with this person, but the the community and the individual also deserve that we do it with compassion, we do it with an understanding that this is another human being and not a piece of trash that's just laying on the yeah. beach. Yeah. And compassion will prompt the question in you of how a talented person like that ends up sleeping on the beach. Mm-hmm. You know, how does a talented person like that, he still has his guitar, but where is the guitar case? Right. Where's his shoes? Yeah. Where's, where's his family? Yeah. You know, uh, there's, there's probably very... Um, sad answers to some of those questions. Yeah. And, and not all of that is necessarily his fault. Right. And, and it's worth asking him if we have compassion. And granted, that we're going to get a lot of bad answers. We're going to get a lot of self-inflicted answers, a lot of things that are not pretty. And when you're in law enforcement or if you're a chaplain, you, you ask those questions and you get answers you don't like. And that's, that's sad and it's, it's a human tragedy. Yeah. But it's still worth asking. Yeah. You know, because because you you do get to to see a different side of them. They're no longer just adversarial. Right. Now now they're a fellow human being and there could be a connection. And and there was there was joy and happiness in your voice. You're talking about him playing and the yeah. the, uh, the joy of discovering that he was super talented. Yeah. And that's 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 a blessing to you. Yeah. You know, that that you wouldn't have had right. if you hadn't have been curious enough to to engage him that way. Yeah. Yeah. He made a difference. And, and, uh, you know, I'm hoping that I made a difference in his life, but, uh, so it's that, that mutual difference making that we can do. And that that's, that's all we can do in my opinion. And we just go out, show up, do the best we can do with what we have when we have it. And, uh, yeah, we're going to screw up, but if we're doing it with the right intentions, you're, you're bound to make a difference. 
Yeah. Something I noticed when I first started doing ride-alongs years ago, I would be with the cop in the car and we'd get called out and, you know, maybe be one of those busy nights where there's you know already five or 10 calls pending, you know, and they just, just go to the next one, go to the next one and deal with every kind of ridiculous problem and every kind of serious crisis and everything in between. And, and you would see some of these difficult people and even as a chaplain, I'm just observing, and I'm like, ugh, this isn't worth our time. Yeah. This, is, this is frustrating. Why'd they even call us? And repeatedly, I was surprised at the officer I was with. And maybe maybe it was exaggerated because they were riding with a chaplain that night. But, but they repeatedly would surprise me with how compassionate and patient and, and concerned they were. There's a lot of my... my uh, restored faith in humanity that comes from watching police officers show compassion. Yeah. When I didn't expect that, I thought, oh, they'll be more cynical than I am. Right. And then I'm shamed that <laughs> a police officer, you know, is, is genuinely interested in this, this pathetic person yeah. and, and cares about them, might even reach into their own pocket to help mm-hmm. them. Uh, that's, that's really encouraging to yeah. me. Uh, and so when I see another cop, who is beaten down and discouraged and just doesn't have the energy for that. Uh, I mean, what can I do, maybe in your opinion, what, what can I do to, to encourage that police officer and get them back to where they're investing in people and not just prejudging them? Yeah, it's, it's hard because it's got to come from that person. You know, it, it's, mm. you can encourage. I think the biggest thing for me was to find life out of law enforcement you know, and just and make sure that wasn't my whole entire identity. And uh, so I think just by being there, like you just said, I mean, wh- when you're riding along, they may be reacting in a way that they might not be reacting, but they've got a chaplain <laughs> riding with them. So I, I think that's what there is a little bit of pressure just me being there. Yeah, suppose, exactly. But, uh, yeah. but I mean, there's... but at the same time, I wasn't telling them right. to go be nice to them. I, right. I just assumed, hey. The South officer will handle it the right way. I'm not yep. going to get involved. But I was privately, you know, in my own mind, being maybe more judgmental than I should have been. Yeah. And and surprised again over and over. Yep. Again, I would see these officers show compassion and interest. That yeah. I thought, wow, that was unwarranted. But I'm sure impressed by it. Yeah. I just started at the beginning of the year. I just started instead of, instead of asking people how are you doing, I'll ask people. Um, what's the best part of your day so far? And then right away, like you, even if they're like ready to start whining and complain about whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Then it's, it like right away, their mind shifts into something. Okay. The best part of my day. Well, let me think, you know, and then they have to like, Oh, I'm, I'm going to steal that. It's it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can just see their, their wheels going, especially the chronically negative people. So I think by doing that and then just, being non-judgmental ourselves and when when and maybe listen to a little bit of venting but uh if it's the same vent that you've heard the last three years you've known this person uh of that oh poor me let's have a pity party and and the world's against me and the world's crashing down on me but when you're in that mode you can't you can't see it and uh how many cops do you talk to and when you say how's it going and the response is live in the dream, and yeah. it's like a prison. A, a sarcastic, a sarcastic response yeah. that implies that they're not happy. Right, and it's a prison yeah. sentence, you know. And and from yeah. in Minnesota, we could retire at fifty or fifty-five is the optimum age, but we can start drawing our pension at age fifty with a penalty. And and uh, I've always told people like if if this is career, if it's burning you out that much, there are other things out there. Or yeah. Stay in your career, keep doing the, the job that you're doing, but find some some support networks out there because yep. that's not a healthy if it's a prison sentence for you and you're marking down every day and you can tell me, you know, three years, six months, you know, three weeks, four days, and two, you know, go break it down that much before you right. can retire. Uh that's a red flag in my opinion. But it takes it takes other people to kind of maybe gently remind you, or maybe it's not even a gentle reminder, but it's these <laughs> Normans and these Joe Kamishes and the, the Jameses of the world. And 
Uh, it's these people that that we're dealing with that yeah. that can make a difference if we allow it to, you know, in our own head to not make it so adversarial and to treat them like a human being. That's that's where I think we can change ourselves and and we can see that there's a lot of really bright, beautiful, really cool things out there. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, thank you, brother. My wife and I are opposites in many ways, but like a lot of married couples, that makes the pair of us very balanced. She likes to tease me that I'm the naive country mouse and she's the savvy, street smart city mouse. And to some degree, that's kind of true. I grew up surrounded by trustworthy people, and I lived on this earth for quite a while before I really spent any time with someone who wasn't trustworthy. My wife, on the other hand, she grew up around sketchy people. She's always looking for how someone may try to take advantage or cheat or steal. And she's especially worried for me that I'm too vulnerable to people for whom I'm trying to give them a second chance or I'm just trying to see the good side, which may or may not actually exist. On the flip side, there's people that she had doubts about that I encouraged her to give them a second chance and it worked out beautifully. So we managed to balance each other. And this would be my advice to you, is to find balance. You obviously can't be naive in a job as dangerous as law enforcement. You have to have your guard up to some degree. Everybody knows that. But being a complete cynic is not necessarily the better path. And a lot of times, cynicism is just fear pretending to be wisdom. It's the fear of being hurt again. It's the fear of being vulnerable. So overcorrecting from naivete to cynicism is going too far. So find people who can help bring balance. If you're too far to one side, pair yourself up with someone and give special attention to people who can bring you back toward the middle. On the next episode of Hey Chaplain. And he did a career in homicide and just like I had and realized that it had changed him and not necessarily for the better. You know, his wife was, was beside him the whole time and encouraged him to seek help. And after he ended up retiring, he goes and seeks help. Now, the funny thing from my perspective, having worked with Tony, so I worked with Tony as a partner. We were inc incredibly close. Uh, we did a lot of traveling together, a lot of teaching together. I was a supervisor for a brief period of time, and I never thought anything was wrong. I actually looked at Tony as like, man, he's the guy that's got it together. He can deal with all this stuff. He still has a great family balance. Like he seems he just, squared away. Yep, 100%. And not to say he wasn't, because he was. He's, you know, was a phenomenal investigator, um, great, just a great person, uh, a role model of mine. And but it just, I didn't realize he was hurting until he actually took the step and retired. Uh, and was going to start the Compassion Alliance and approached me about coming on to the board and getting it launched off the ground with him. And that was the first time that he was comfortable sharing with me that the things he had seen on the job had impacted him and that he needed help. Perhaps you are plagued in your patrol car pondering how precisely can the police combat crushing cynicism, cling close to compassion, and keep communities calm, carrying on consistently when cops are confronting constant challenges and discouraging chaos? Well, this podcast is clear of commercials because listeners who want to encourage cops, buy me a $5 virtual coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash heychaplin. You don't even have to do that. You already get the show for free. But thank you for making it possible for police officers to hear something positive. The views expressed here are the personal views of the hosts and our guests and do not necessarily represent the views of any law enforcement agency or its components. If you like this episode, please share it with a cop or someone who loves a cop. Thank you for listening to Hey Chaplin. And as always, pray for peace in our city.
I don't think we need to add anything. Cool. I know I've got enough material. I've been recording for an hour. <laughs> and so we've got enough material to to absolutely, you know, split that up and do like a two-parter. Nice. Uh, I've got an opening in February, and I'll just use the week after that to do the second part. So, cool. So this will actually be turned around pretty quick. I, I have a guy. In fact, he's the – it'll be next Monday's episode. A fantastic police chief from Colorado – and really like him. Um, did an interview with his wife. Her interview was fantastic. And but I did an interview with him, and then I've sat on it for like four or five months now. And and I just didn't have a good place to put it. And so I've I've it's been on the shelf for it's like four and a half months I think now. Yeah. And I, I apologized to him the other day. I said I really <laughs> am going to use that interview. It was a great great interview. I fought this guy on PCP and got thrown through a window and a James. <laughs> And it was crazy, crazy story, good story, and a good, good Christian man. I really, really respect him, but I feel bad that <laughs> I record this interview like back in August, I think, <laughs> and uh, and still haven't used it. So this will actually turn around in like maybe less than a month. Oh, nice! So, so that'll that'll be quick. Cool. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and hit the stop button so the two sides can both upload.